If you're seeing this video, it's because Allah wants you to see. If you are passionate about Palestine, if you really want to help our brothers and sisters in Gaza, please, please, please donate for my fundraiser. Yes, there's a siege right now, but inshallah, as soon as the siege ends, we're going to get as much in as possible. Alhamdulillah, we've raised an insane amount so far, so you guys are absolutely incredible. I don't need to beg you, just donate inshallah. If you want the good deeds, if you don't, you don't have to. Um, okay, so today's topic. So this video is actually a long video that I've watched three times because there is a lot in this video that people need to know. And this video is talk is by the Israeli general's son, who is pro-Palestine by the way, and he's talking about the Israeli war crimes, why they're doing what they're doing, the Israeli public opinion, and just generally a lot of things that we need to know as Muslims who support Palestine. There's going to be a lot in this video that's going to surprise you, it's going to shock you. Um, and yeah, so I've just picked out sections from this uh, hour and something long um, podcast that the Israeli general's son did with a, a fellow American. I'm going to start with a little introduction so you guys know who he is and then we can start speaking about the nitty gritty, what we need to know about Israel's intention with Palestine and how we as Muslims can stand up for the Palestinians. Sure, so like you said, I was born in a, in a very, very, very Zionist family. My father, like you said, served as a, was a general in the Israeli army. He was a young officer when Israel was established and you know, had a military career. And my grandfather was a signer of the Israeli Declaration of Independence. So I come from a Zionist family through and through. You know, many family members of mine had important positions prior to the establishing the state, and then and then once the state of Israel was established, and had you know had a you know very very uh, strong impact and influence on on what the state became, and what the army became, and um, and. Uh, my transformation obviously was gradual, and I always say, you know, major transformations, especially in, in terms of our of, of how we view the world, usually come up as a result of a terrible tragedy, sadly. And so, although again, I was pretty far along, but then uh, in 1997, um, my sister's little girl was killed by Palestinians in an attack in Jerusalem, and that's. Precisely the, the type of uh, the type of, uh, of of experience that shakes you to the core and, and forces you to to you know reexamine what you believe in, reexamine the truths you have been taught, and reexamine the reality in which in which you exist. And that's precisely what I did. And I ended up I ended up reaching out to Palestinians um, in Palestine and to Palestinians here in the United States. And thankfully, I was surrounded by and welcomed by Palestinians. Again, both in the United States and and in Palestine, although they had no reason to to accept me and 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 be so as warm as welcoming as they were, and gradually they took me through this very difficult step of, you know, realizing first of all that there are two opposite narratives, completely opposite narratives. They don't differ in in detail or in nuance. They differ fundamentally. And then, um, you know, take me by the hand like a baby learning to walk uh, to slowly and gradually realize that the truth that I believed was the truth or the, the truth that I was taught and that I believed in was really a lie. And that the truth actually uh, is on the other side of the story. The other, the Palestinian story is the truth. And it's a very difficult thing to do, especially when you come from a kind of a, you know, uber patriotic Zionist family like myself. And like you said, when I was young, of course I was a Zionist. I, you know, I, I was looking forward to serving in the army. I was looking forward to, you know, presenting Israel and doing everything I can. I believed in it wholeheartedly. But then eventually the meeting with Palestinians, the discussions with Palestinians and stepping on the ground into Palestine, realizing as, you know, as the title of, of my the subtitle of my book is, you know, journey of an Israeli in Palestine. I realized that I was an Israeli, but I was actually, I existed in Palestine. And of course that book, the journey forced me, and it actually helps a lot of other people too, when they read the book to take, to go through the process of understanding what's an Israeli, what is Israel, what is Palestine and how do these things exist uh, simultaneously, even though you've got these two fundamentally different narratives. 
So his story is really important just to introduce who he is, where he comes from. So he was an Israeli general's son and he was brought up in Zionism. Zionism is in his bones. Um, but he I saw the light and he changed his mind once he met Palestinians, spoke with Palestinians. It's just, it's just good to just sort of set the scene on who this guy is. And mashallah, I mean, it takes a lot to do that kind of change. I mean, I became Muslim, so I know what it's like to make a huge change in your life. So mashallah. Um, his point of view is really important because he knows what it's like to be on the other side. And he knows what it's like to be on the other side in the extreme. He was an extreme Zionist brought up in like a military Zionist family. So he knows what it's like to be on the other side in an extreme way. So his point of view is really um, interesting and he actually knows a lot about the Israeli narrative that we need to know. You know they, they say you should know your enemy. This guy's not our enemy, of course, but it's good to know what it is, what they want and what they're trying to achieve if we genuinely want to help the Palestinians. So now in the next clip, he's going to be talking about um, how Israel have got such strong connections and how they have managed to stay strong and pretty much convince the world that they're the victims when they're bombing innocent people con continuously and it's blatant who the oppressors are in the situation but they managed to convince the world they're victims so much so that there are people praying for their success and McDonald's are donating 4,000 meals a day to them which is ridiculous so let's hear how they managed to do that uh, this is uh this is the trajectory now israel has been at it in terms of the media you know for over 100 years the zionist movement uh, invested heavily in the very very early years not only in connections with the media but with you know uh culturally and uh, politically and and in every other way that they could to influence american and western thinking in general they didn't only do this in the us and they, like I said, after a hundred or so years, you get very good at this. And, and now you don't really need to convince an American politician to support Israel. It goes without saying, because they learned it in school and they learned it in church and they learned it in synagogue and they learned it in whatever other activities they were part of as they were growing up. And, and another thing that the Zionists learned very, very early on, particularly in America, is that all politics here is local. So in every city you go to, every mayor gets a trip to Israel funded by whatever, some, some Zionist organization, every police chief, every member of every city council, even the smallest cities in America, and on and on and on. So they've, they invest heavily in this, and they have been for a very long time. So it goes without saying that you support Israel because that's what they've been taught. That's what they know. That's what they're comfortable with. Um, um, See, that's really important to know how Israel has become so strong in in these Western countries. And it's just pure, I mean, like he said, it's a hundred years. It's not just, they've just woken up one day and gone, I'm going to be your friend, let's get in. Like, this is a hundred years, I've rooted a hundred years in the Western media and the Western politicians and the police chiefs and taking them to Israel. It's all very manipulative and it's all been going on for a long time. This is not a plan that's just hatched over the last years, the plan that's been going on for a long time. Um, and that's really important to know when, you know, coming in contact with these high up politicians or police chiefs, what they've been, what kind of propaganda they've seen. And the next clip is talking about the deep rooted racism in Israelis. This is really important. I want to talk about the racism here in the United States, the racism in South Africa, the racism in Israel, in terms of having a grip on people's mind. I think it's a great point, particularly with all the, you know, there's this rumor mill uh, that Israelis are, or somebody's putting out there, but, it, but a lot of people are, are buying into that there were, you know, um, beheadings and babies were murdered. And, and now there's a new rumor that uh, they beheaded and tortured pets and, you know, and, on, and women were paraded naked and raped and so on. And all of these things are being refuted very easily. Um, and I think that's part of this um, uh, this effort to describe what we saw, the attack by Palestinians from Gaza, but to to kind of describe Arabs in general as kind of a a crazed, you know, savage mob. 
that when they see a white woman, they're so in, in sense that they absolutely they're just in, they have to rape her, you know, they have to, you know, strip her naked and rape her and and, and parade her and so on. It's, it's, you know what I mean? As though this was you know Roman legions or something. And uh, and it's it's part of this it's part of this Islamophobic uh, you know anti Arab anti Palestinian uh, uh, propaganda that's taking place here and in Israel very very heavily both in both countries. Um, and then there's a there's been a video that's been going around of a woman who describes how in one of the kibbutzim in the south describes how the fighters came in, they talked to her a little bit. She said, "Look, I've got children here." She said, they said "Don't worry, we're Muslims. We're not going to hurt you." And then, you know, let her into the secure room, locked her up, and then and left. You know, not the kibbutzim where all the fighting was going on. And um, but th- this is exactly it. They have to continue. They have to keep pushing these racist stereotypes against Arabs, against Muslims, against Palestinians to show them as being, you know, uncivilized mobs. And so this narrative that they push is the only reason why they're able to get away with what they get away with, because they convince the public, they convince the people that these Arabs are these unhuman you know why i'm using that word horrible barbaric people that need to be killed that need to be uh, completely obliterated this is the only way they're able to get away with what they're doing is by creating that narrative of the deep-rooted racism of arabs are evil we must kill arabs oh i hate this subject is so hard to talk about, seriously. Um, I, wanna, I wanna talk about why this attack happened when it happened, the military impact on it. Obviously, the Israeli government, you know, their, the, their dominant narrative is this is our September 11th, and like the United States declared war on uh, Muslim countries everywhere, invaded Afghanistan, invaded Iraq, bombed Libya, uh, invaded, sent troops to Syria, bombed Syria, uh, all of it done under the banner of the war against terror, that this will be that this will be used by the Israeli government, as we can clearly see, to try to do what the Israeli government has wanted to do for a long time through imprisoning the people in Gaza, terrorizing people, creating life in the West Bank where a big part of the Palestinian population still lives in a way that makes life very, very, very hard, uh, where Palestinians are treated basically in, in, you know, as, as not just second-class citizens, but even worse. Uh, that they want to drive the, they want to drive the Palestinians out. They want that land. This is about land. This has always been about land. It's been about expansionism and taking somebody else's land and doing it over a long-term uh, period. But the Palestinian resistance has created many, many obstacles uh, to that uh, final solution, so to speak, for the Israeli government, which is to get rid of all of the Palestinians. So they, they want to do that. That's what the Israeli government hopes to be able to do at this moment. Whether they can do it, that remains to be seen. But I want to talk about the military side of this. In the recent couple of years, and especially in the recent period, Miko, There's been a rising tide of Palestinian resistance in the West Bank and elsewhere in historic Palestine. And I've seen reports, and you will know, but I, not being an expert, not following as carefully as you do, I don't actually know this, so I'd like you to respond to it. There were reports that the Israeli military had to remove some of its troops from the area around the fence where Gaza, where the people of Gaza are basically in prison. Uh, to other parts of the West Bank because of the growing tide of resistance, and this made the Israeli uh, military more vulnerable along the fence where the incursion took place. Uh, Long term, though, you know, can the Israeli government completely snuff out the Palestinian people as it desires? And doesn't this incident, no matter what the level of Israeli retaliation, no matter how brutal or genocidal it might be, it seems to me that it's it's revealed us a vulnerability that exists in, for the Israeli military and the dream of constantly expanding Israel and constantly driving the Palestinian people out. Uh, there are certain vulnerabilities that the Israeli government certainly does have, and 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 its population does have 
in the face of this kind of seemingly, at least in the outset, very successful military operation that took, seemed to take the Israeli military by surprise? Well, I'll start with the end. There's no way in the world that Israel can eliminate the Palestinians or the Palestinian resistance. The Palestinian resistance is, 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 is vast and, and diverse. And, um, and as you well know, the vast majority of Palestinian resistance has, has got nothing to do with, 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 with picking up arms. It has to do with other, other ways, civil disobedience and so on, which we've seen over, you know, since Israel was established. And Israel has been paranoid about all forms of Palestinian resistance, killing writers, killing poets, killing artists, killing, you know, clergy, cleric, killing uh, intellectuals and on and on and on. Definitely. And I think you made a really good point. This is about land. This is about gaining land. This is about making Israel into the dream Jew homeland, what everyone thinks they deserve. Not everyone, because there are a lot of Jews that don't subscribe to that school of thought. But this is all about gaining land. This is all about just completely getting rid of the Palestinians and just having it as the, the dream land because the Palestinians ruin it or whatever. And, you know, taking, taking you know, killing innocent civilians who are activists, who are writers, who are poets, who are academics and fighting for the cause, you know, this really shows like how scared Israel are of the Palestinian people. Yeah, that's the picture. That's that's what's been going on ever since this uh, this this began. The um, first of all, showing that only one side is evil, only one side is killing the other. And you know, I have to say, I, I don't like to get into the gory and details of what happens when people die and the pictures of the dead and the burnt and so on. But what do people think happen? What do they think happens when a one ton bomb or a half a ton bomb? is dropped on an entire on a on a apartment building you know and it, it affects an entire block i mean the entire block just is, disappears city block disappears what do you think happens to the children there they don't think their heads are crushed and 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 you know and dismembered you don't think children die from the fumes and have you know get stuck in the rubble and die slowly. I mean don't they think these horrifying things take place and they take place by the thousands when Israel is bombing Gaza by the thousands. You know, never mind all these stories about, about Palestinians doing this have, have been proven to be untrue. But this is happening right now as we speak, as these massive bombs are falling on apartment buildings. What do you think happens to the children in those buildings? What do you think happens to their little bodies? Do people need an actual, an actual description of a step-by-step -step how these young bodies get dismembered and die and the ways in which they die i mean we gloss over it completely we see a building collapse we hear that there were i don't know 20 30 40 however many people were killed how many ever dozens were wounded and we move on you know suddenly everybody uh, uh, here in the u.s and of course israelis have to describe every single they found a baby that's head was chopped off and a dog first of all like i said it's not true you want to know how many heads get chopped off in a, when, a, when, when, when the pictures we're seeing right now, what happens to the heads of these children? You know, if we want to get into that conversation, it is really not going to be, you know, come out very well for the people who support Israel. If anybody cares about children's and their bodies and their well-being, look at these pictures. What do you think is under this rubble? What do people think is under the rubble when these, when these buildings fall? A terrorist? No. This is all civilian. It's always civilians. Palestinians, first of all, are all civilians. They've never had a military. They've never had an army. You know? So suddenly they're shocked. I remember this happened in the past. This happened before. Uh, at some point, people were asking me, what do you say to the, you know, I forget what the story was, but there was some story, similar story to this. I said, what are you talking about? Look what's being done in Gaza. What do you think happens to the people, these, the children that are being bombed? Gaza has 55% of the people in Gaza are, oh, are under the age of 18. These are, it's a community. It's an entire society of children. And when they walk to school in the morning and the bombs come down, what do you think happens to them? What do you think happens to their heads? This is such hypocrisy. It is enraging. This, this, this hypocrisy, these attempts to show the other side is evil while completely glossing off the savagery by Israel and with the support, like you said, Israel, like you said earlier, support of the United States. These war planes are American planes. And it's not, you know, this, this, this is horrifying.
Nobody thinks that all of the smoke comes out after all these bodies have been decimated and burned. You know, and the people who are dead are sometimes luckier than the ones who survive because there are no medical facilities. Hospitals have been bombed. And even if they weren't bombed, Israel doesn't allow the supplies to come in. And there's no electricity. A hospital without electricity, they have to use a generator, which means they need oil, which means the, the gasoline is running out, diesel is running out as well. You know, this is a, this is a cruelty and a brutality that is uh, unbelievable. And Joe Biden talks about the other side, the Palestinians as being evil. <sighs> SubhanAllah. That was hard listening to. I've listened to it a couple of times, so I should have been, I should have listened to it without crying, but it always keeps me emotional because that's just absolutely inhuman and horrible. And it hurts so much to think of the injustice that exists. And I pray, I pray to Allah that he frees the Palestinian people and that any uh, Palestinian people that are martyred that go straight to Jannah, inshallah, and subhanallah. And to think about the fact that this morning Israel announced that people living in North Gaza have 24 hours to relocate. It's too much. It's all too much. And if you're listening to this and you're pro-Israel, the fact that you got this far, I'm just like, if you're still pro-Israel, then you're just like some insane human being that needs to be going to a mental asylum. Because from listening to him, you must understand that the 55% children in this place that are getting bombed, it's absolutely barbaric and it's absolutely horrific. It's the worst kind of injustice. I'm sorry to put a downer on people, but this is really important. Please donate, please pray to Hajjad, please keep spreading the message because too many Muslims are not paying attention. I'm talking to Muslims and they don't know what's going on. You have to know what's going on. It's absolutely Im imperative that you understand what's going on and that you spread this message because if we don't spread it, no one's gonna spread it. Yes, there's amazing Western activists that are probably doing more work than what we're doing. We need to put in the work, so please, please, please keep spreading the message. Please donate and please pray for our brothers and sisters. <sighs>